Welcome to our service this evening and we trust to be blessed. Our speaker tonight is Thomas Craig from Newton Irish, he's been with us before and we're looking forward to what the Lord will say to us through him tonight. Welcome and some of our visiting friends tonight, you're very welcome and be at home amongst us and we trust to be blessed as you listen to God's word and hear our prayers for those who are in need. We're just going to open our time with prayer and then Thomas will take over. Let's pray together. Jesus Father, we come into your presence again this evening and through the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the access we have in and through his precious name. And we just ask, Lord, as we come together this evening to hear your word, you would speak into each of our lives tonight. Mm. You know what each one of us needs to hear. And we just pray for Thomas as he would open your word and explain to us those things that you've shown him in a quiet place, and that we each may hear your voice, and we may be obedient to your voice, and as we come around your throne later on, that you will be pleased to put upon us a spirit of prayer, and help us to supplicate the throne of God tonight on behalf of those who need our prayers. So Lord, just be with us now, in accordance with your promise that two or three are gathered in your name, to be there in the midst. So Father, just be with us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Okay, Thomas, you? I've been told this is turned on, but I don't know if that's... Can we... You can hear me okay? Okay, that's good. That's good. Oh, good. Good man, can I? Good. All right, folks, good evening. Um, it is a, a real blessing just to be back with you here at Cumber Baptist this evening. and just have the opportunity to have fellowship with you and the privilege of opening God's Word with you. Uh, once again, I was actually due to be here uh, at a midweek back in really early November last year, um, but I was told last minute by my manager at work that I was actually going to be in Birmingham that week, um, and so I was really grateful for the, the grace and understanding of Alfie, who I'm sure had to do a bit of a, a last minute save in order to draft in a, a speaker on short notice. Um, so thank you to Alfie for that, and also for your um, warm words of welcome here tonight. Um, I bring hellos and well wishes from the church over in Newton Ards. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, our congregation was celebrating um, God's incredible, sustaining, and providential and all-consuming grace as we look back on 100 years of the Lord's work being carried out from the church there to the town of Newton Ards. It's with the eternal plans of God in mind that I trust you'll join me tonight in opening God's word in this place. I've been challenged particularly in my own Christian walk lately in regards to the incredible and yet mysterious ways in which God himself brings about his purposes in the life of the believer. While we might often get caught up in putting the events of our lives, both the good and the bad, down to human effort, um, mere coincidence, or the most common of all, passing blame onto other people, I trust that as we meet here to study God's word tonight and to later on bring our requests to him, um, to his throne of grace and prayer, that each of us here who hold the title Christian will with fresh eyes and with renewed understanding see how the God of creation has brought each of us through our past into our present and with confidence we know he'll sustain us right in to our future as well. Tonight I want us to focus in on the incredible story of Joseph from the latter chapters of the book of Genesis. It's a story that no doubt each of us here will be quite familiar with. Um, It's a story that despite as well its flamboyant nature and many inaccuracies, many of Western civilization will actually know as well due to the musical renditions of Joseph or the cinematic releases that have been premiered around that story, almost an underdog story of Joseph. Tonight we're going to be diving into the story of Joseph towards the final few chapters of Genesis. We're going to be paying careful attention to the words that Joseph uses in the opening verses of Genesis 45. Just before we read them together, I just want to give us sort of a bit of a hyper summary as to where the story of Joseph has brought us to in this stage. Up to this moment, we've been introduced to the man Joseph. He's the favoured son of a man called Jacob, otherwise known as Israel. He's a son who's been presented with a distinctive coat of many colours. With his clear premium standing with their father, and due to some dreams that he's had, which seemingly point to one day his brothers bowing down to him and his parents bowing down to him, His brothers come up with this scheme to get rid of their naive and detestable little brother. They firstly plan to kill him, discard his body to the wild animals. But instead, after intervention from the eldest brother, Reuben, they decide to sell him into slavery, to lie to their father and tell him that he had been attacked 
and savagely killed by a wild animal. We then go on this roller coaster journey of Joseph as he's imprisoned and enslaved in Egypt. He's entrusted and favored by Potiphar. He's then accused and demoted by Potiphar's wife. He's imprisoned and found to be gifted by Pharaoh's baker and chief cupbearer who have had dreams that he's able to interpret through God. Two years on, this is now 13 years on of being imprisoned and going through all the motions. He's recommended by the chief cupbearer who remembers his ability to read dreams to go and present himself to Pharaoh who himself has had a dream that he has no idea what it means. No one can tell him. Joseph interprets this dream through God. He interprets it for Pharaoh and speaks of seven years of plenty, then seven years of severe famine that will take hold of the entire land and surrounding nations. He's also given details by God on how he's supposed to tackle this great famine. Pharaoh recognizes Joseph's favor with God and his wisdom and his leadership. He is promoted to second in command over the entire nation of Egypt. And he begins unfolding the plan of stocking up food during the years of plenty and then distributing that food during the years of famine. He single-handedly is responsible for the active and orderly survival of the entire nation of Egypt. And that brings us up to where we're going to read from tonight. We have a group of men coming from the land of Canaan. They travel to the land of Egypt in order to purchase food for their own survival. And who are these men? None other than Joseph's own brothers. Although he recognizes them, the brothers are none the wiser of this man's identity. And after putting them through various trials to see if their hearts have changed, we're going to read together in Genesis 45 when he drops the bombshell of who he truly is. So if you've got your Bible with you, we're in Genesis 45. We're going to read the first 15 verses that we find there. This is the word of God. Then Joseph could not control himself before those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children, and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, and all that you have seen. Hurry, and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Folks, tonight as we meet in this place to pray, I want us to use this time to consider our past, our present, and our future. Particularly in relation to the beginning of the statement made by Joseph here in verse 8, where he says, So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Christian, tonight let us be in no doubt that God has incredibly orchestrated, purposed, and has a specific plan for our lives. No matter where you find yourself tonight, we did not get here by our own strength, by mere chance, or by other people's doing. We're here by the grace, will, and providence of God. Very simply, our message from tonight will be laid out under the title and the the main points, what was, what is, and what will be. What was, what is, and what will be. Firstly, what was. As we look at the provision given to Joseph here, even throughout a life of twists and turns, of mountaintop blessings and and deep valley lows, 
we have to reflect on the journey that each of us here too have been on. From the miracle of our own births and the intentional creating of us in our mother's wombs to the various moments of glorious happiness we've experienced to even the moments where we felt such unimaginable grief and sorrow. We too must reflect as Joseph has in this reunion with his brothers to say it was not I who got me here and it was not you and it wasn't others. It was God. Brothers and sisters, tonight we're sitting in this place and we, if, we, if we know the joy that it is to be in a relationship with Jesus, we must look back on our past in such a different light than those who are outside of Jesus. I can't tell you that I know what your past has entailed. The pains that you've faced or the joys that you've had. But I know that your presence here tonight at the prayer meeting tells me that you want to be here. You are clinging to Christ. You want to be with your brothers and sisters You want to be here to pray, to hear God's word. You want to meditate on his word and to rest in his sovereign will. You might be here tonight and you actually feel relatively content, maybe a little bit stuck in faith almost. You're comfortable where you are. Maybe your health isn't really a worry right now. Finances are okay. You know what, that's that's quite good. You know, that's that's a nice place to be, and we can give thanks to God if we are in that place. But you might be here tonight and you might be experiencing hurt physically, mentally, spiritually. You might have such a loss and consuming sense of misdirection and and waywardness. Tonight as we consider what was, let us remember who our God is. Who he is and what he has done. Because in the midst of loss and uncertainty pain and rejection. What we read here in the story of Joseph is that he shows forgiveness to his brothers, but he also points all of the purposes back to God. Tonight, if you're a saved child of God, the word of God leads us to that exact same place. Because while we're on a journey, on a walk with the Lord, one that might take us into some of the darkest valleys we'll ever experience, we can have confidence tonight that the one who made us in his will has sustained us in his providence who has saved us by his grace and who has brought us to this place now in his strength will not leave us in this place forever. Whether tonight you find yourself in that mountainside top of of blessing or a low-cut valley of, of sorrow, the Lord God of our salvation speaks to us tonight through his word and says, I am the one who brought you here. Take heart though, because I'm working all things for your good and for my glory. Your good times will not last forever. The same as your sorrow will not last forever. A better time is coming. Better than your best of days. We know that by faith in Christ we have a hope that no one can take from us. A hope that is grounded in the love of Jesus. It's been established by his sinless life. Finished by his sacrificial death. And perfected by his rising again from the grave. And his ascension to the Father's right hand. Tonight when it comes to what was... Let us each be in no doubt that the God who called us out of our sinful state, who transformed us to new life in his son Jesus, he's brought us through all of life's highs and all of life's lows to this very moment. And he'll continue to do that until the day we're called home or until Christ himself comes to take us to that home. What was? It was not I, and it was not you, and it was not others. It was God. He brought us here in his will and by his love and through his providence. Right now, these feelings we have, the the pain we might have or the joy we might have, God's word reveals to us here tonight that there's purpose behind his will. There's meaning behind his ways. There's reason behind his plan for you. And here's the thing, it's personal to you. He has a plan for you personally, exclusively, sovereignly. But what about the now? Because while this verse in Genesis 45, 8 calls us to look back and say, yes, God has brought me through. What can we say he has brought us to this moment for? Why are you feeling the way you are? Why has God blessed you or almost seemingly left you in this place of hurt? Why do you feel lukewarm in your faith? Why are you here at the prayer meeting? While God had a plan for Joseph to go to Egypt in order to provide for the nations and ultimately provide for his own family, which in itself, if you know the story of Joseph, is an amazing thing because the line of Joseph from his family would go from Jacob 
to Judah, all the way down to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Their survival in that famine was absolutely imminent to the plans of God. When we look at how God provided for Joseph to be in that position, we know that God can speak into every single one of our situations tonight. It would take a considerable amount of time to go around the room and address every single one of us in the place that we're currently at, in the here and now. But simply put, what we've already looked at tonight, what we've thought about, is that God's word coherently tells us tonight that where we are is by his grace and for his purpose in our life. Sometimes concentratingly put as for our good and his glory. So what does that mean? Aside from maybe being a term that we throw around from time to time to bring some kind of comfort or um, navigation to certain moments or situations of our lives, for our good and and his glory is a phrase that should fill us with a renewed joy, but also an immense sense of fear when it comes to the God in whom we worship. We have joy in knowing that, like we're reminded in Proverbs 16.9, that while the heart of man plans his way, it's the Lord who establishes his steps. We can find much joy and peace in that. And yet for our good and his glory can often see us entering and being transported through the most difficult of life's situations. Yet these two remain for our good and his glory. Because in success, God teaches us to be humble. In despair, he teaches us to lean on him. In waywardness, he draws us to himself and he provides his word as a lamp onto our feet. In grief, he assures us of his presence And he gives us a peace that passes all understanding to those who will call on his name with a pure heart. In this moment, we're passing through life as sometimes is detailed in both the Old and New Testament as something like a refining fire whose heat and intense nature may at times drive us to our knees in despair and surrender. And yet we know the one who's refining us. The one who has called us into this fiery furnace in order to purify for himself A people who will boldly stand up and say, I am a child of God. In what was, we see how our God is the one who has saved us, sustained us, and brought us to this very moment in our lives. In the now, we see that our God is working all things for our good and his eternal glory. As we face the refiner's fire, we are being shaped and molded into an ever more likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that there's nothing in this world that can remove the gift of salvation from us. There's nothing we're going to face in this life that God will not be with us through and he won't guide us out of. We've reflected on what was. We've considered what is. But as we soon prepare to lift up our voices in prayer and praise to God, let us conclude by just briefly pondering on what will be. Through the trials and the blessings of our lives, through the radical love of God demonstrated by the sending of his son to die on the tree of Calvary. It's by these means that we look ahead with a renewed sense of purpose, with a reaffirmed sense of confidence and and citizenship. The experiences that we have are being presented with in our lives are not just for mere emotional and, and physical pleasure or pain for us. The events of our lives are used Yes, as we've already mentioned, they're they're used to refine us, to make us stronger, more faithful followers of Christ. But additionally, they're to be used to call us into service, to call us into action towards those around us. Our experiences in faith, both of striving and struggling, blessing and brutality, success and sorrow, they're to be used for the glory of God. If you're here and you find blessing in the word of God, You've received the good news of the gospel. You're called to share that message with the world. If you're here and you've faced trials, you've faced such serious pain and loss, you're called to be a source of comfort to your fellow brothers and sisters who are facing such similar pain right now. You're also to reach out to a world that's hurting with the message of a God who has comforted you through your lowest of moments. Our experiences in this life are one that despite the personal repercussions and results that they brought about for us, they're not experiences that we are to to lock up and be ashamed of and pretend never happened. Christians, your walk of faith, no matter how long or short it might have been, it's one that can be used to disciple and comfort, 
to help or challenge someone else in this world. The story of God's providence and his help to you is one that can be used by God to bring about his holy purposes through the encouragement of another brother or sister or even in conversation with someone who's not received Christ and the Holy Spirit works in that moment to convict them of their sin. Christian, be encouraged tonight that our God is a God who does not leave us nor forsake us. He's a God who knit you together in your mother's womb. He has sustained you physically. He's grown you in wisdom mentally. And he has saved you spiritually in this world. He's with you in that refining fire. No matter the temperature that you're currently facing, the trials and the hurt that you might be experiencing or will experience, the anxieties and concerns you might have for the future, he calls us as his children to recognize his purposes in our lives, to have a pure heart, that is willing to speak light into the darkest of our neighbor's situations, to share truth in your own homes and our friendship circles, to share our story of salvation in Jesus to those around us who need to know him. Tonight, let us be in no doubt like Joseph. It was God who brought us here. It's God who is with us here. And it's God who's going to lead us forward to serve him wherever he would take us and whoever he would place in our way to speak to. The story of how Jesus saved you is a powerful story. Please share it. The news that Jesus died for sinners is a transforming piece of news. Please tell it. The knowledge that our Father has a perfect and sovereign plan for each and every one of us tonight is a comforting one. Please embrace it. Tonight may our prayers reflect our thankfulness to our God, the one who has saved us. May they acknowledge the God who has kept us and brought us to this very moment of our lives. And may our prayers call out for the saving of others, that they may too have confidence and the hope that we have in knowing Jesus as our Savior, but knowing heaven as our eternal home. Folks, let's just pray. Dear Lord, we just come before you tonight and we want to thank you for the opportunity to gather in this place. Lord, we thank you that we can gather here as brothers and sisters, part of the family of God. Lord, it is with confidence that we can say that Jesus is our Savior. Lord, it is because of Christ, because of his sacrifice, his willing sacrifice on the tree of Calvary, that we know this world is not our home. Lord, we are called to citizenship in heaven. But Lord, we reflected tonight on the story of Joseph. As we reflected on that story, we remember how he stated that it was not his own efforts that took him to Egypt. It was not his brother's actions and their sins towards him that took him to Egypt. No, Lord, it was you. Lord, you are the one that took him there to sustain his family, to sustain his line, his family line that would then lead to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we look back and we say, it is you that has brought us here. We look at our current present situation and we say, thank you, Father. We acknowledge that there is a future and that future calls us into service for you. And it starts at this very moment. Lord, that we would share our faith with those around us who do not know you, who are lost, who are separated from you, who are heading to an eternal death and have no idea that it's coming. Lord, that we would have a heart for the people around us, that we would really, really care, that we would seek to bring Jesus up in conversation in the everyday. Lord, that we would have a sense of urgency to reach our friends that we would have a sense of urgency to see our family members saved. Lord, tonight as we pray for these things, may may it be that we pray in spirit and in truth, that we lift up our voices to your throne of grace, and it's only by Christ that we can do so. Lord, we thank you for this time spent around your word, but we just pray now that you would embolden us to speak out in faith, in prayer to you, that we would encourage one another, that we would add our amens to our prayers that your will would be unfolded in this town of Cumber, 
in our country and across our world. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.